indeed um i think that if i start all the people will miss is my introduction so i think that's not a uh, a major problem so perhaps we can get underway so my name is charles briggs i'm the chair of the folklore graduate program at the university of california berkeley the campus sits on Wichian territory, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Cochenio speaking Olón peoples, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. The land was and continues to be of great importance, importance to the Olone tribe and to other familial descendants of the Verona band. So we appreciate the permission um, to be able to be here and to gather together even on the virtual campus of Berkeley today. I want to begin by thanking Laura Perez, the director of the Latinx Research Center, who is the, the co-sponsor of this event today, and to Leah Busby, who is our folklore archivist who did all of the hard work to make it possible. This lecture series honors Alan Dundies, who was a Berkeley faculty member from 1963 until his death in March 2005. He both created the Folklore Graduate Program and built it up over four decades into a program that has trained many of the current leaders in the field of folklore worldwide, uh, including another of them who happen to be on this particular uh, Zoom screen right now, um, and has helped uh, challenge also nationalist borders by bringing faculty members from all continents to teach at Berkeley. Professor Dundee's published more than 250 scholarly articles and more than 20 books. He influenced the structural analysis of folklore, the ethnography of speaking folklore, and particularly his favorite area, the psychoanalytic study of folklore. Now, this year's Dundee's lecture is appropriately enough, a former Dundee's student, Dr. Solimar Otero. She started her career right here at Berkeley, receiving her BA summa cum laude in anthropology and winning the McCown Prize for Outstanding uh, Graduating Senior in Anthropology. Upon uh, finishing, she entered the PhD program in Folklore and Folklife at the University of Pennsylvania. After teaching at Louis Louisiana State University, where she directed both the program in Louisiana and Caribbean studies and the program in comparative literature, um, and she has moved to Indiana University where she is professor of folklore, acting director of Latino studies and editor of the Journal of Folklore Research. Dr. Otero is the recipient of a Ruth Landis Memorial Research Fund grant, a fellowship at the Harvard Divinity School's uh, Women's Studies Program in Religion, and a Fulbright Fellowship, as well as teaching awards. Dr. Otero's first book, Afro-Cuban Diasporas in the Atlantic World, is a fascinating exploration of circumatlantic migrations that include the transatlantic slave trade and the repatriation, the return of people uh, from the Yoruba and Afro-Cuban diasporas to Lagos, Nigeria. She documents successive waves of the transcontinental movement of emancipated slaves of Yoruba descent between Havana and Lagos, creatively using a wide range of ethnographic and folkloristic research methods, including historical sources, testimonies, novels, poems, songs, and interviews. Drawing on her training in Yoruba language, she worked with both Afro-Cuban descendants and traditional chiefs in Lagos. Dr. Otero's ability to move subtly between folkloristics, critical race theory, diasporic studies, and religious studies enabled her to attend to how strategic religion, religion switching, like code switching, between Catholicism and Orisha traditions fostered both a complex process of reinsertion into Nigeria as well as ways of sustaining multiple diasporic identities, forms of relatedness, practices of memory, constructing futures as much as past. One chapter returns to Cuba to bring the Cuban Nigerian experience to bear on rethinking the politics of blackness on the island. Incredibly germane for current efforts to reposition slavery, not as a past historical event, but as a, as a continuing process. The book challenges linear, one-way, uh, unidirectional, and rigidly teleological accounts of the slave trade as a one-way process going from Africa to the New World, rather tracing multiple dynamic connections between Yoruba, Afro-Cuban worlds in Cuba, and um, lives in, in Lagos, enables her to document the shared experiences of time, space, colonialism, violence, and survival that shaped, in her words, 
the fluid nature of the formation of Afro-Latino identity. Now, I'm not going to say very much about the book that she published last year with Columbia University Press, Archives of Conjure, Stories of the Dead in Afro-Latinx Cultures, because it's the focus of her talk. And besides, um, I'm sure you'd much rather listen to her talk about it than me. Uh, I will make three small points about it. First, it presents a transformative challenge to ethnography and ethnographic writing business as usual in folkloristics and anthropology. The subalterns with whom she crafts transcripts, objects, and practices of writing are the more than human actors that we often call the dead or ancestors, um, not subjects locked in rigid categories of race, class, gender, sexuality, or nation. Second, the book's ability to challenge Eurocentric and patriarchal um, forms, uh, uh, assumptions that linger in folkloristics also emerges from a deep engagement with work in LGBTQ uh, uh, plus studies, Latinx studies, comparative literature, and religious studies. The third point is, I urge you to read the book. Uh, a model of scholarly collaboration, Dr. Otero um, has edited special issues uh, of Chiricu, Western folklore, and, edit, uh, and has an edited collection called Yemoya, Gender, Sexuality, and Creativity in the Latino and Afro-Atlantic diasporas. In addition to co-editing what promises to be an exciting collection entitled Theorizing Folklore from the Margins, Critical and Ethical Approaches, Dr. Oteta has published articles in Southern Quarterly, Transforming Anthropology, the Afro-Hispanic Review, Atlantic Studies, Revista de Investigaciones Folkloricas, Black Scholar, Africa Today, and the American Journal of Psychoanalysis, as well as the Journal of American Folklore. The latter including an article that will appear in a special issue on Latinx folklore, transnational women of color feminist perspectives that she is co-editing. And it gives me great pleasure to tell you that the title of her lecture is Archives of Conjure, Healing Materialities and Race. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Otero, alas, virtually back to Berkeley. <laughs> Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Before I share my screen, I wanted to acknowledge and honor the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people on whose ancestral homelands and resources Indiana University is built since I am speaking to you from Bloomington. Uh, I want to thank Charles Briggs for this kind invitation to deliver the 2021 Allen Dungy's lecture. I'm grateful to Laura Perez and the Latinx Research Center for their sponsorship and support of this presentation. I also want to thank Leah Busby from the Berkeley Folklore Archives for her help and guidance in putting this evening's program together. I am so humbled and honored to be with each of you tonight. I began my journey as a folklorist here at Cal about 25 years ago when I walked into Anthro 160 Intro to Folklore and witnessed how Professor Dundee's captivated a class of over 150 undergrads by just reading a bibliography. I was hooked by his passion and wisdom and spent the rest of my time as an anthro major, budding folklorist between the library and the long line outside of his office during office hours. So those of you who are students know what I'm talking about. He nurtured my interest in Afro-Cuban folklore, gender and sexuality studies. Dundee's urged me to read Julia Kristeva, study Yoruba and listen to my mother and my grandmother's stories about Cuba. By the time I went off to pursue my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, I knew I had a grounding for, for a life in folklore because of Alan Dundee's. So delivering this lecture has deep meaning for me. And I hope you enjoyed the talk, which is dedicated to my ancestors, especially Jose Diaz Casada, Mercedes Albuquerque, and of course, Papa Dundee's Igbae. I'm going to share my screen now. And I think we should be at the presentation. Wonderful. It is a humid October morning in Mantilla. I'm sitting with my godmother, Tomasa, next to her prenda, an Afro-Cuban entity that is housed in a cauldron. She is communicating with El Señor, 
as he is known in our house, with the chamalongos, discs of dried coconut. Our conversation turns to spirit guides and how they make themselves known in dreams. So Masa shares that all of the dead have given me their names in dreams. The first time that I saw him, El Senor, standing by the window, it frightened me so that I woke up and I got up like a bolillo. And later, the second time that he revealed himself to me, now more or less, you understand, little by little. I became adapted to it, but it isn't easy at first. If you're scared of them, you can only imagine. Tomasa, as a Yayankisi, an elder priestess of the Afro-Cuban Palo tradition, is well versed to talk with talking to the dead. Tomasa's spirit guide, El Señor, acts like a father figure, a protector that serves as a resource for her and the spiritual community she serves. The revelation of the dead's names and dreams is significant. Naming is an especially powerful tool in conjuring reality and presence. Thus, the revelation by El Señor signals a transference of power, kinship, and the solidification of a mutual bond. It is understood that embarking on a journey of proclaimed kinship with the dead is not easy, will challenge, challenge accepted standards and perceptions of reality and take time. My book, Archives of Conjure, takes to heart Tomasa's suggestion of dreaming and vivifying the dead. In the study, the dead ancestors and deities are actors in multiple forms of kin and world making. Alongside these entities and the spiritual ecologies of the Afro-Latinx communities, being explored demand ontological reframings of the connections between humans, non-humans, and the environment. In reaching for an ethically engaged world from the perspective of Afro-Latinx religions, a material semiotics emerges that situates kinship beyond human-centered experiences of place, time, and materiality. To be specific, this work is about how Afro-Latinx non-material or occasionally material beings like Egun, the dead, and Orisha, deities, become active agents in the world through rituals, archives, and the creation of art and material culture. Sites like the ocean, the rivers, altars, libraries, and living rooms in Havana provide the context for understanding where these multiple engagements are activated. Residual transcriptions are links to how co-presences interact, influence, and guide human actors like scholars, artists, and practitioners. Residual transcriptions as vernacular notations made in rituals and found in archives create the routes to the collaborative, spiritual, scholarly, activist work that are archives of conjure. This work is not about official discourses found in religious institutional control of social behaviors and the construction of subjectivity. Though I address issues of patriarchy, racism, colonialism, and homophobia in Afro-Latinx religious cultures, I am most interested in revealing the creative strategies presented by non-material agents in providing effective interventions in these legacies of violence. I use the term Afro-Latinx to describe the racial, cultural, and gendered fluidity present in transnational expressions of vernacular religious practices like Espiritismo, Palo, and Santeria in order to place into historical context the vernacular narrations of stories told by the dead. Afro-Latinx vernacular traditions of narration and ritual kinships reveal a range of connections with the dead whose residual forms reside in archives, ritual, art, and material culture that houses and activates them. Examining these practices of spirit and materiality as an archive of conjure, I argue, transmits the complexity of inhabiting multiple forms of being in terms of race, gender, sexuality, and place. The residual transcriptions and practices explored in the book also point to different ways of looking for evidence or describing experience that both constitutes and vexes historiographic and ethnographic modes of investigating Afro-Latinx religions, expressions, and communities. Archives of Conjure pay particular attention to how divinities and spirit guides interact with and mark the kinds of work that scholars, practitioners, authors, and artists produce. My work explores how Afro-Latinx how Afro dead narrate temporality, cartography, and race into being through embodied practices like dreaming, stitching, washing, scribbling, beading, dancing, and writing. In doing so, 
one can observe the nature of the active presence of entities collabor as collaborators, muses, and co-authors in the creation of scholarship and the enactment of theory in Afro-Latinx religiosity. I choose the everyday expression of devotion found in Afro-Latinx religions as my main lenses for exploring the active presence of spirits in the study because of the unorthodox nature of quotidian personal practices and their openness to religious admixture. Throughout this study, I go back to the popular practice of misas espirituales, Cuban seances as sites of religious remembering and spiritual futurity. Contemporary Spiritismo originated in 19th century France and became popular in Latin America and the Caribbean through the writings of Alan Kardec. The spiritual collaborators that emerge in the book, uh, like spirit guides, uh, Ta Jose, La Gitana, uh, come from my own specific points of contact. Havana, Cuba, between 2008 and 2019. However, the questions I pose about materiality and spirituality are situated in a myriad of temporalities and geographical locations explored in the archive, ritual, and literature. And uh, to be clear, I became part of this uh, community that also includes a family members uh, in 1999. The importance of non-Cartesian epistemological and ontological modes of existence are highlighted through the ritual work, storytelling practices, and ethnographic writing of Afro-Latinx spiritual practitioners. Cuban Espiritismo, Puerto Rican Santeria, Brazilian Candomblé, and Caribbean literature provide modes of exploring questions of shared subjectivity, authorship, and creativity in this work. Based on over 10 years of fieldwork and archival research with Afro-Latinx spiritual communities in Cuba, the Caribbean, and the U.S., this study puts into conversation Espiritismo's philosophies of the transmigration of the soul with Edward Glissant's concept of the transphysique de la relación and Fernando Ortiz's notion of transculturación. Here, vernacular religious work with Caribbean experiences of society and history reframes how the dead narrate material culture. In this book, Afro-Latinx spiritualities are the modality that conjures scholarship, art, and ritual. These inspired acts of engagement with the unseen but felt forces trace important past and future trajectories. Conjured archives, therefore, operate within networks of reception and reinvention that can be hidden in plain sight, undetectable to the uninitiated observer. For example, beaded jewelry colors and hairstyles of Afro-Latinx practitioners may or may not signal relationships to historically specific deities, places, and narratives. The creation of coded alternative public spheres based on the fluidity of vernacular, maybe even street archival practices, is a vital repository for groups suffering from institutional repression. Likewise, ancestors and LGBTQ plus practitioners of Afro-Latinx religions enact archives of conjures to navigate the violence of their experiences of religious intolerance, white supremacy, patriarchy, and homophobia. Conjuring as an archival practice becomes a vibrant mode of restructuring past resistance into, activated, uh, into an activated guide for future resilience. Conjure creates its own cover because you have to understand its logic to see it. An archive of conjure becomes accessible in ways that can weaponize its contents, as with other material artifacts created by and for the dead, because they are made with the idea of vivification and healing in mind. This healing is often accessed through the generational trauma of slavery and sexual violence that the dead in this book relate in their, with their stories. Thus, archives of conjure necessitate a kind of hidden transcript that ensures safe spaces for work with them to be efficacious and sustainable. My interest in the dead comes from a multifaceted relationship to my Cuban and Puerto Rican cultural roots. As a child born in Southern California to a bilingual Puerto Rican father and a Cuban, a Cuban Spanish speaking mother, my Caribbean home life contrasted sharply with school and public life, even in terms of Latinidad. Our spoken Spanish, foods eaten, and spiritual practices were sharply infused with an African inflection that differed from our mostly Mexican and Central American friends and neighbors. I remember my mother putting out flowers and a vaso de agua a glass of fresh clean water every July in commemoration of my grandfather's death. 
She spoke to him then and often, telling me about dreams where she would visit with her father in a chosen space by a waterfall. These connections to the dead were not considered mysterious or exotic. They just were. However, I was told not to speak about them, especially at catechism or with outsiders. People would not understand and, are cons and consider our practices brujeria, witchcraft. In writing this book, I faced the same dilemma in terms of trying to explain deeply held beliefs that create ways of being in the world not readily understood by outsiders. As an interdisciplinary folklore scholar, I understood that for some mastery over certain subjects required the dissection, analysis, and classifications of cultures and texts. I consider this kind of approach to scholarship to be especially violent, yielding only a projection of what the researcher has ingrained as colonial practices of enforcing intellectual authority. Instead, I have opted for an, an approach of engagement where I am sharing authorial intent with practitioners, collaborators, and the dead. I do scholarship in regards to putting theory and practice into conversation with different kinds of representation and performances critically. However, I believe that I have learned my propensity for bricolage from Afro-Latinx and Caribbean practitioners of spirituality, philosophy, and the arts. In the spirit of reciprocal ethnography, I am taking seriously interlocutors like spirits and orishas that make up my religious, familial, and scholarly community. Archives of Conjure offer more than alternative sources for creating history and remembering. They suggest new ways of traversing temporality that are connected to Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ plus projects of futurity that rely on rethinking agents of history through enacted practice. For Afro-Latinx religious remembering, practices of inhabitation are central to understanding how materiality operates in a fluid ontolo ontological universe that operates on intention. The supple relationship for, between form and its animation, whether it be in the flesh or in art, can be revealed through the study of narratives of ephemerality and the materially sacred. The rituals of writing analyzed in this volume traverse multiple routes of getting to and from the dead through scholarship, art, and the imagination. Taking a cue from both work that relies on and questions the interaction between spiritual agents, historians, and ethnographers, this project also invites literary and archival cohabitation as processes of conjure that negotiate who is speaking through whom. I experienced my own literary and archival cohabitation with Cuban ethnologist Lydia Cabrera's Archive of Conjure. A defined border crosser in terms of sexuality, scholarship, visual art, and religious expression, Cabrera wrote insistently about water entities. Her book, Yamayayo Chun, significantly shapes understandings of the two divinities through sexuality and the homoerotic feminine. Over the last 10 years, I have interacted with Cabrera's notes, letters, drawings, and scribblings in her archive at the Cuban Heritage Collection housed at the University of Miami Libraries. What I have, what I found shows a daughter of Yamaya whose ties to the ocean make her an ambivalent sojourner who never felt entirely at home in one place. Her kinship with like-minded authors and scholar artists like Reynaldo Arenas and Pierre Patumbi Berger comes to the sea as a site of contemplation and acceptance with the experience of being a Cuban, a Caribbean sextile. Mobility, but also statelessness is fueled for Cabrera by social structures that govern notions of gendered and sexual respectability in both Cuba and the United States. I find that she fights back by writing in an ironic and gossipy reframing of oral tradition, ritual history, and mythology fueled by Yemaya Iochu. Her work importantly creates routes to feminist and LGBTQ plus narrative histories of Santeria. Her re-representation of gods with regard to story, gender, sexuality, and presence also included intricate uh, drawings on stones, doodles, notebooks, consecrated beads, and a bedazzled Virgen de Regla. Residual transcriptions like the stones, beads, doodles, and statue found here work in archives of conjure to produce methodological questions with regard to how we think about the connections between ephemerality, temporality, and material culture. Like the dead in a misa, 
scholars as ancestors leave clues in the archive on paper and through artifacts. My own search revealed that beading and sewing are referenced and reproduced in papers, objects, and drawings by ancestor scholar practitioners, practitioners like Lydia Cabrera and uh, anthropologist Ruth Landis, who, who worked with women in Candomblé and Bahia in the late 1930s. These testaments created by scholarly ancestors speak to the importance of materially traced spiritual cartographies. Patterns, colors, stitches, and beads, dolls, and cloth are vital elements to understanding the roads of transformation that residual transcripts can take in becoming archives of conjure. The literal handiwork of beading or writing left behind by the dead is brought back to life through the restitching re or rescribbling of the living. Thus, the transgenerational shared labor that occurs in archives of conjure reveals how element, how an element of cyclical flow is central to navigating the very objects found in these repositories. Studies of material culture in Afro-Latinx religions show how the vernacular arts are rich sources of cultural history, mastery of skill, and individual creativity. Constantly changing art and material culture in this context act as archives of conjure that respond to past and present afflictions facing a religious community. They serve devotional purposes in documenting relationships face, um, serve devotional, excuse me, purposes in documenting relationships between practitioners and beings in ways that also visibly and invisibly mark the bodies of believers in the form of beads, scarification, ingested substances, apparel, and so on. For example, Cabrera's sanctified beads, Landis's spirit dolls, and Tomas's altar for Chango and Santa Barbara mark spiritual connections created through Afro-Atlantic art. In some cases, objects are made in gratitude, gratitude seeking to please and delight divinities and observers alike. Ruth Landis's doll is one of a set of four candomblé spirit dolls that she kept throughout her life. She noted that they were, quote, handmade for me by cult daughters in Bahia de Todos los Santos on the tejero of the cult, end of quote. It is significant that the dolls were made by candomblé worshipers on the site of their temple because this indicates a high level of dedication and skill in creating these powerful objects of conjure. I examined and touched the dolls upon a visit to the archives at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in 2019. Dressed like Iyaloja, market women of Bahia, each is dedicated to an orisha, wearing their corresponding devotional beaded ileke any day, a bracelet. There are two dolls for Eshu, one for Shango, and one for Jemanja in the collection. These little ancestors were dressed in a stylish Bahian cloth with tin earrings, high-heeled shoes, and beautifully embroidered red lips. I keenly observed with the care with which these elegant companions to Landis's life journey were ritually prepared. They clearly resembled the Bahian market women Landis drew repeatedly as residual transcripts on scraps of paper in her notes. One sketched in pencil has scrawled as a signature drawn by Ruth Landis, a Bahiana. And this emphasis you can see here in the original uh, transcript um, that, that uh, was in her archive. These candomblé dolls make manifest a sisterhood that sustains Landis's connections to Bahia at a situated place and time. Dan Landis's archive, a conjure, points to a specific set of stories, practices, and knowledge belonging to Orisha women, Orisha worshiping women of late 1930s Bahia. She participated fully in the work of cooking, sewing for, and being healed by Sabina, Sese, Mai Mahenina, Yulala, and Oshun. The priestesses recognized her as a spiritual kin with Sabina and others exclaiming at a gathering in 1939, quote, it is so clear, Ruth Landis is Oshun. It is so totally clear, end of quote. And as Landis herself recalls at a 1939 December celebration for Oshala, quote, yes, you know when a santo comes for it is a kind of swooning feeling. You feel you can't feel the earth under you 
and you grab around for support and can't feel it, end of quote. These testimonies show that this sisterhood did the embodied work of speaking truths, making art, and becoming gods. They did so in the context of racial, political, and social strife, as Landis repeatedly remarks on police presence, interference, and repression at the Tejeros in 1939. It is important to view the residual transcripts of Ruth Landis's field notes alongside her spirit dolls because they provide a woman's archive of conjure with stories of the dead that is also a palimpsest. This archive offers a layered temporal and ontological repositioning of subjects through continual revisiting. Landis joins other egun, other ancestors that include her dolls as, as, as an important ancestor in the repository. It is no surprise that the dolls for Eshu are women of Candomblé. Eshu is the owner of the crossroads between life and death, whose female spirit from Brazil is Pompigira. Pompigira is a female Eshu known for helping women in abusive relationships, prostitutes, as well as trans women. This correlation situates Landis's and the doll's journey within a framework of allure, pain, and rebellion that belong to a larger collective of womanist and LGBTQ plus ritual practices in Brazil. The above commentary on Landis is an unfinished story that has potential for thinking through the dilemma of reading transcriptions and archives of ritual work. A starting point to look at how similar intersubjective narratives get shared, inhabited and repurposed through transcriptions are created during um, ceremonies like contemporary Cuban misas, um, Cuban seances shown here in this slide. During a misa, the dead tell stories, give advice, propose future rituals, and request that a variety of material culture be produced on their behalf. These mandates are communicated with and through mediums' bodies and are usually transcribed on site, copied, and then passed around. These circulated and repurposed spiritual transcripts kept within the community as notation in libretas and archived in material culture, continue the collaborative work of ritual communion onto other sites um, and modes of creative expression. And I would just like to note here, you see Tomasa, my madrina and the mother of the house with a pen and paper in her hand transcribing, um, and she's dressed in white transcribing at the Misa here in, in the act of doing that work. By evaluating an archive of conjure co-produced by the dead, which includes ethnographers like Landis and Cabrera, and also spirits who emerge at a ritual like the Misa represented in the last slide, I'm also suggesting a recalibration of folklore methodologies that explore the experiences of time, spirituality, and materiality. This means that taking notice of vernacular transcription helps one to consider the cyclical nature of scholarly and creative work done in Afro-Latino religious cultures that is also communal. Furthermore, the texts and subjects I'm addressing here are mobile and transforming. For that reason, my methodological questions reconsider what transcripts and archives are created to do. The effects and affects intentioned in residual transcriptions provoke future material and ephemeral acts of creation, ritual, and scholarship. Thus, these stories of interaction with spirits create mirrored archives of conjure through material culture. The papered residual transcriptions that are reinscribed onto threads that beat ilekes for Oshum and so clothes for spirit dolls, and each bead and stitch are connected to and vivify a history of touching the dead. What does it mean to look at expressive culture inspired by the residual transcripts created from rituals like the Misa or the archives? Can we see, feel, apprehend aspects of spirits in cloth, smoke, and herbs that we are urged to use after a ceremony? These questions ask for a change in assumptions on how to conduct ethnographic fieldwork and archival research. An approach that embraces the temporal arcs that residual transcripts and spiritual material culture point to is also able to grasp the cyclical nature of such work. Instead of seeing artifacts and archives 
as products of one decipherable ephemeral moment. Objects like spirit dolls, beaded vessels, and offerings at altars provide invitations for revisiting and renegotiating spiritual connections repeatedly. These relationships are intimate and rely on effective bonds that are relational in nature, yet deeply entrenched in the, textured, in the textures of a racialized historical memory. Here, I'm reminded of David H. Brown's observations and his rich and detailed work on Santeria altars, vestments, and adornment. Quote, cloths associations of loving embrace, spiritual protection, and cleansing are reiterated in Lukumi Ebos offerings in which they are integral to human divide cycles of gift and exchange, end of quote. Ebos are offerings to Afro-Latino, Afro-Latinx entities. Brown's comments illustrate how cloth, asho, and yoruba invokes bonds of affection and memory between devotees and the divine. These bonds draped in cloth and as offerings at altars visibly express extended kinships as archives of conjure whose textures tell us volumes about how vernacular history is aesthetically and physically marked by Afro-Latinx religious communities. The residual transcripts, they point us towards instinctual readings often shunned due to the deep distrust of feeling and perception inherited through discourses of quote unquote objective analysis that are, that are in and of themselves colored by unchecked Eurocentric prejudices. Yet feeling through residual readings can bring us closer to the poetics of Afro-Latinx histories and experiences often ignored in the archive or ignored because of their illegibility due to the very narrow view of what constitutes a record of the past or what counts as a verifiable story. But how do we read altars, flowing cloth, beaded designs and processes that create objects dense with meaning and communication? And here I know that Martin Sang is in the, uh, is in the crowd, an artist, scholar and great friend of mine. And I am very grateful for him, um, for him allowing me to show his work and to talk about his, uh, his work. Martin Stang's recent work on Chinese on the Chinese influence on Afro-Cuban sacred beating traditions for the divinity uh, Remaya, Yamaya and Regla, uh, Cuba sheds methodological light here. His careful study of the creation of beaded vessels for Yamaya by an elder artisan priest and his apprentices pays attention to the important association between vessel, the human body, and designs as representative of divine shared human divine shared subjectivity. What I take from Stang's attention to the artistic process is an encouraging model for investigating the multiple and changing forms that spiritual materiality can take. Vessels that hold manifestations of Yamaya require the preparation of designs on paper and several stages of planning and execution. Beading, drawing and sewing are referenced and reproduced through artists and spirit mediums as tangible testaments to spiritual cartographies. By evaluating a conjured archive that is co-produced by the dead, I conclude that we rethink ethnographic methodologies and frameworks and folklore anthropology and perhaps even historiography. By conjured here, I mean paying attention to the invention of sites, agents, and affects in conducting research reframing ethnographic methods and notations based on vernacular transcription practices also requires asking what kinds of work are notations based on vernacular vernacular practices um, what the, what kinds of work are these are these um, contexts asking us to do what are they created to do more than invoking an ethnographic present such transcriptions on site and in the archive urge the construction of a mag magical futurity one where the transformative properties of conjure are collaboratively harnessed through practices, again, like drawing, sewing, and beading, for the continued elaboration of transnational Afro-Latinx histories and communities. Ritual, ritually prepared sites like altares, tronos, and bovedas, the spirit's table as seen here, are essential components and participants of Afro-Latinx religious performances. These constructions frame liminal spaces where connections to extensive, often ephemeral kin can be developed through multiple performance practices, naming, 
singing, embodied motion, including dance, and the further shaping of material culture. The bóveda, or the spirits table, does not symbolize spirits. It does something as them. The elements of water, air, fire, and earth are also present at the table in ways that do work. The bóveda allows art and objects that remember, heal, witness, and resist being forgotten. This allows for medians to have visceral experiences of ancestors privately and in communion that also generate new actions and relationships through conjure. Conjure in Espiritismo's context are acts of becoming, ontological negotiations between ancestors and mediums' bodies, mediated often through material culture of the bóveda and makes material memories of race, ethnicity, pain, and migration. Following Fred Moten, Sounding blackness occurs in the scream of the objectified, the signals and anti materiality that is painfully, quote, that is painfully and hiddenly disclosed always and everywhere in the tracks of black performance, end of quote. Here, Moten illustrates how matter and sound can move through each other through the metaphor of the mother, the matter, with regard to birthing both memory and intergenerational trauma of slavery through black performance. The ways that mediums and ancestors share bodies, voice, movements, and subjectivities line up with how animateriality can be understood in this particular black performative context. Rituals that bring out the dead necessarily narrate their strategies for resistance and agency in a contiguous other life. Work with the dead operates art as art performance and ritual within our skins in significant ways. In Espiritismo, lessons to mediums often include descriptions of conjure to be reactivated by the living in a kind of magical pedagogy for fighting against personal and systematic injustice. The creation of art, material culture, and the use of organic medium are central and cl cleansings and protection spells prescribed by ancestor spirits. For example, mediums and other kinds of practitioners can be told to make spirit dolls, cleanse with herbs, and perform other acts of commemoration with and for Afro-Latinx spirit guides. These enactments and objects that are produced from them clearly emerge from a black aesthetic of animateriality that is also creolized and holds the very tensions found in the historical realities and cultural crossings of Latina and Afro-Caribbean coloniality. We rely on layered approaches to practice memory and community because of constant persecution misunderstanding and disenfranchisement. Rooted in histories of slavery and colonialism, practitioners of the arts with the dead and the deities create innovative ways of never forgetting that actively fight against white supremacy, patriarchy and homophobia by making Latina, indigenous and African inspired gods, spirits and things that are constantly being reborn. I now turn to Arturo Lince's piece, Celestial Dreaming, shown here, where the spirits of the departed Afro-Atlantic young men and women bear witness in art by taking up trans-intangible space. Trans-intangible space, excuse me. Lindsay's collaboration with late African-American playwright Entosake Shange on his Celestial Dreaming painting series also includes a set of poems by Shange, Smoke Voices, Interviews with Spirits, and the Art of Arturo Lince. This project vivifies black lives ended through violence in words as well as portraits of angelic constellations. These angelic figures look back at the viewer in a manner that inspires recognition and testimony. The celestial journeys of spirits of murdered young black men and women take the forms of hearts and patterns of light. Lindsay related to me that this work situates a belief in reincarnation and return visually it asks us to confront the existential consequences of a deeply and blindly divided political and public culture. Holding this gaze requires work from the interstices, from a place of in-betweenness and connection. And um, I have a chapter based on this specific work and other of um, Arturo's performance work that he did in Africa's healing work in the um, Theorizing Folklore uh, volume that's coming out from IU Press um, this June. Work at the Bóveda similarly marks multiple biographies and sojourns of the dead and the living who come to the table at the interstices. 
whether they be accessed by spirits or mediums, the art and material culture found on the Boveda, like memory objects, are like memory objects in that they evoke past and significant social relations, kin, friends, and colleagues. Guides and practitioners certainly share a kinship based on this intertwining of art, objects, stories, and selves. These elements combined shape the destinations and fellow companions present during the metaphysical travel that happens at Latina and Afro-Latinx sites of art and spirit making. Here, I am reminded of Jose Esteban Munoz's suggested, suggestion that a brown sense of the world allows for a quote, flowing into the common that nonetheless maintains the urgencies and intensities we experience as freedom and difference. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my work um, on, uh, on Oriki and drag, just so that people get a sense of how that's being dealt with in the book. In Afro-Latinx religious cultures, the captivating gender fluid deity Erinle is central to understanding the multiplicities of gender and sexuality that exist in a religious becoming that can also make a part of the brown commons. I, I just um, quoted um, Munoz talking about. In my chapter, Sirens, I show how queer Caribbean popular cultures create kinships that deeply borrow from Afro-Latinx mythology and spiritual family building, where both Erinle and transformistas, drag queens, perform a range of subjectivities of rituals co of cohabitation. In reading ethnographic narratives about Erinle, along with Cabrera's stories about Yamaya, and as well as Mayra Santos Febres's novel, Sirena Selena Vestida de Pena, I show how sexual and gender forms of the sea like mermen, mermaids, create an imaginative palette with which tales of desire, violence, and healing are performed. In particular, I theorize the lip sync of the siren drag goddess as a form of oriki, Yoruba praise poetry, that creates an embodied merging of performer and diva who is invoked through the act of performance. Issues of inhabitation and voice emerge as modes that destabilize universal subjectivities. As an Afro-Latinx siren, Inle is an important deity for understanding the performance of queer spiritual kinship and the complexity of simultaneously inhabiting multiple forms of being. In Cuban rituals celebrating Inle, the Archangel San Rafael is also invoked. The hagiography of the latter's movement as a healer using fish creates a fruitful associative plane with the riverine uh, Erinle. The book looks at the way in which Cabrera's historiography concerning San Rafael and Inle includes LGBTQ plus priestesses and practices from Havana in the late 19th century and early 20th century that also suggests multiple layers of coding, resistance, and creativity. We're able to see a continu continuity of artistry, elegance, and mutability in situating Erinle's ritual and material practices with contemporary drag performance and transgendered writing. The sea, fish, and sirens tie these elements together symbolically and literally through glissants, transphysical poetics of the Caribbean. A non-transcendental multi-temporality is asserted when varied forms of being emerge simultaneously through the waters. This denseness of time and becoming happens through inlay and, transform and transformistas in the embodied fluidity of ritual and song. In merging the stage and the altar, orishas and divas share legendary performance status. This, this image is of legendary mother, Carmen Extravaganza from the New York House of Extravaganza with her Oshé for Shango in the background. It, it poignantly illustrates the merging of kinships and embodiments I have been speaking about today with regard to the lived experiences of Latino Caribbean practitioners of the arts and spirituality who work with their hands on stages and at altars. Afro-Latinx transformistas renditions of deities also suggest a kind of reading that acts as a vernacular metacriticism. Performances of inhabitation follow the fleshing art of great figures and songs through unique personalized renditions. Transformistas homages to divas like La Lupe or Celia Cruz behave like Oriki. Yoruba praise poetry that calls down deities or celebrates heroes through elaborate wordplay. In Nigeria, women are the masters of Oriki, especially in terms of performing with lightning speed, the satire, punning, and play that can both exalt and sting the subject of the poetry. In a similar fashion, 
transformist, a transformista's ability to play multiple kinds of lip service through reading as well as the lip sync is vital to her social standing among other queens. Thus, verbal agility is a central aesthetic for praise performers, performers whether they be oriki singers or transformistas. Both sets of artists seek to reveal multiple manifestations of legendary and immortal figures through their performative work. Spirituality and sensually infused movement, dance, objects, and words are arsenals of expression that illustrate the intimate historical and cultural connections that lie within Afro-Latinx worlds of performance. Again, the organizing principles of a transphysical poetics of being and becoming allow for the body and sacred art to become malleable and open to co-presences and transmission. The marriage of these different yet adjacent traditions of vernacular expression and popular cultures create a unique opportunity for locating queer Afro-Latinx and Caribbean sites in multiple genres of artistic work, including literature, performance, and ritual practice. Indeed, Afro-Latinx queer and feminist cultures of performing diva spiritualities is the Oshumare, the rainbow, that traces the affective geography of emotion and desire through an archive of conjure that regenerates, remembers, and recreates. As with Tomasa's dead that started this book presentation, I'm asking that we sit and pay attention to the many ecologies of being that surround us. What can paying attention to the dead and their accompanying environs really do? I believe it compels us to act ethically within a larger focus of the cycle of becoming that includes endings and mysteries. The study of folk religion, vernacular art, and belief is layered with evidence of how especially women and LGBTQ people create connections to spiritual entities that leave traces as residuals for future generations to conjure. Through unfinished notes and vague instructions, we are asked to creatively connect and complete projects that in themselves will need to be recontextualized excuse me, that need to be recontextualized for future generations. Ultimately, we find that there is a constant dialogue waiting to be ignited through our intuition, imagination, and intent. Through collaborative engagement, we create art, scholarship, perform, and change in the face of sexual intolerance, racism, and xenophobia. This work can be many things at once and may take many, multiple forms, like the sea and the rivers, the flow can transport us in different directions of discovery and recognition. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really quite lovely and provocative. Well, now we have time since you were um, um, uh, succinct um, for a, a question and answers. What we will do is you know, with the usual standard Zoom practice. If you could please, if you would like to ask a question, um, please open up the chat and um, place in the chat, you know, first of all, your name and just say that you would like to ask a question. If you would like to ask it, you know, um, yourself, great, then we'll call on you and you can unmute or else if you'd like us to, we could also read it for you. So um, thanking once again, Dr. Otero for that wonderful presentation. Um, the floor is open. Using the performative strategy of the of the moderator often jumping in there if there's one of these um, small zoom silences. I have a question for you. I mean, I really am, am impressed with your the way in which you've taken understandings of reciprocal ethnography here. What about your own inscriptions, how you get them to circulate? Your book is fascinating. It's also an academic book. So right. are, do you explore ways of um, being able to, um, in, in different languages, for example, in Spanish, and also through different formats to collaboratively be able to make manifest, again, not just through words, but also images, through sounds, through film. How is it that you try to also make sure that there's reciprocal circulation of this um, of this archive that you are continually producing with, you know, both the living and the dead, the material and the human. Thank you for that question, Charles. That's wonderful. Um, I do translate my work into Spanish and show them to my community that I work with in Cuba. 
um, and, and, and my, um, my community, especially if there's photos or all of those uh, other kinds of components, they get copies of everything first. I cannot even um, publish these without having a permission from the Orisha or the dead. So we use divination. Uh, parts of the book have been read aloud to Orishas and to the dead for um, confirmation. So all of this work, um, even the photographer, um, um, uh, Hector Delgado, uh, had to be vetted through the Orisha and through the Egun before we did any of this work. So this is absolutely reciprocal. Many of the my uh, my collaborators, my spiritual community, many of those uh, folks that you saw at the Misa Espiritual are um, highly educated uh, nurses, teachers, doctors. Um, you know they they have uh, a really good understanding of what the study of folklore is in Cuba. So. It took very little translating in terms of what I was trying to do in terms of the study part. And they were quite excited, I think, um, especially um, there's parts of the book where we have uh, interlocutors like Ta Jose or the Gitana spirit or Madre de Agua, where we asked those entities if they would, they would be allowed to be included in the book. And then afterwards, you know, before publication, whether they were pleased with how they were being represented. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> What well, most certainly does. Um, we have a question here from Sarah Pina. I don't know if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask it. You'd be welcome to do so if you would like to. Uh, sure. Hi, Zoli. Hi, hi Sarah. It's so <laughs> it's nice to, to see you. See you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was so excited um, to find out about this because of Martin. No, I was actually um, doing well. First of all, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, it's always uh, an honor and a pleasure to hear you talk about your work. And um, I know we work on sort of similar topics. And um, yes. when I was defending my dissertation, I remember you asking me, and I keep thinking about this, thinking about affect in the archive. So I wondered if like maybe, and you spoke a little bit about it in the talk, but maybe if you wanted to talk more about your, your own experience uh, with affect in the archives. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question, Sarah. And I'm glad you remember uh, the question I asked you at your thesis defense. <laughs> I, I'm still thinking about it four years later. <laughs> ah, I, I would posit that it's not me making you think about it, that it's Lydia Cabrera who is asking you to think about it. Probably. Sarah and I, <laughs> Sarah and I both, both worked very intimately with Cabrera's archive at the University of Miami, and Sarah does some wonderful work with um, Lydia Cabrera's drawings of, of Jicoteas and, and what, that, what that work does in terms of sexuality. So, um, yeah, uh, I, it's really such a fascinating uh, process to, to take the skills that one uh, develops in doing the spiritual work uh, in terms of, you know, seances or being at rituals and be and paying attention to sensibilities and sensations, whether it's feeling on the skin or something that you hear in your ear or the dreams as uh, this talk started out with, with Tomasa and taking those intuitive abilities into the archive as a kind of an effective space where um, those of you who've worked with archives, you know, some things, sometimes things are where they're supposed to be, and sometimes things are not where they're supposed to be. And even though there's an order at the, in the archive, there is an energy that sends you in different directions. When you're looking in particular at Lydia Cabrera's archive, uh, there, uh, every time I go to her, her work, her letters, this is intimate stuff. And I talk about this in, in the chapter on residual transcriptions, that the ethics that we bring into uh, ethnographic work we must bring into the archive because these are people's lives um, that are out there uh, bare uh, and and open and not only people the little ancestors the, the Landis the spirit dolls uh, I mentioned it at, a, at another um, at another talk that I felt very I would love touching them but I felt very sad that uh, knowing that these are entities that are living in a box somewhere right at the natural history the, the, this museum and what's this relationship between preservation and vivific vivification? So in terms of affect, I said taking those, those skills, taking those intuitive skills that you learn from doing this ritual work and rethinking about how they can be retooled in a place like the archives, which also connects back to Charles' question. What kinds of permissions? What, what's, 
what what is too personal to to be to be shared um what is what is what what is kind of um being reciprocated and looking at the lettered lives of a of a of a person who's an ancestor now and you're looking at their at their work and you can think about it the the actual paper has you know the writing you know the the writing say of cabrera and both landis you know, they're, they're, the energy of them taking pen to paper. That's why residuals transcriptions is so important to make a connection in this book, because the act of writing down what the dead tell you in a Misa and having these transcriptions um, and how that carries kind of an energy and, a, and, a, and puts a pin in that ephemeral moment, you end up with those similar kinds of transcriptions in Ruth Landis's and, Cab and Lydia Cabrera's archives. So making that connection between those sacred moments or those moments of reflection that are found in those residual transcriptions and then actually other kinds of lived experiences, uh, really that's where that affect comes in. And if I can bring in Munoz again, having this idea of this, this commons, you can think of the archive and you can think of um, the communities, uh, I, I, you know, many of some of the people that we saw on the slides have passed away. They're now part of my community but as Egun, as ancestors. So this transformation, I think also, because Munoz talks about this, also includes the dead, right? Also includes ephemerality and gesture as a way of vivification. He's talking in a very different context, but I feel that, but my next work is really thinking about like how these contexts are very, very connected. And that's why the work with Inle and with uh, transgender community um, is, is starting to come, you know, be something that I, I'm, I'm continuing to explore. But in any case, thank you for that question. Yeah. So Sarah, Nick, I, I, maybe you'll be taking another trip to uh, Miami, and uh, and we'll see what what Lydia what Lydia has to tell you. <laughs> yeah, she's calling again for sure. For <laughs> thank sure. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question now from folklore graduate student Julia McEwen. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> thank you for this wonderful talk. I'm gonna attempt to sort of like explain what my question is and we'll see if it runs away from me. But I was very interested in sort of your discussion of non-Cartesian ideas of space um, and the idea of how that works with especially queer people enacting archives of conjure to fight violence that are rooted in like past resistance. Um, and I'm thinking of like Catherine McKittrick's Black Geographies, Demonic Grounds in terms of reimagining space. And I'm wondering like what you would say about doing research in spaces where there might not be as robust a sort of idea of conjuring or speaking with the dead in, in sort of practice, but where mm. at least from your talk, it sounds like archives of conjure are not just situationally based. And, and then along with that, like how can you find materialities in those spaces, if that makes some sense. No, it makes wonderful sense. Thank you, thank you so much for that question. That's a, that's a that's a wonderful and brilliant question. I have like two. two I'm, I'm thinking about two ways of, of tackling it. The first uh, the first one is a recommendation to read the work of my friend Anna Marie Laura and her new uh, work with LGBTQ communities in um, the Dominican Republic. In particular, she works with. Um, she works with uh, with Dominican Vodun, and she has a wonderful book called Streetwalking that looks at Maria Lugones's um, view of La Callejera as a framework of taking up space um, and how LGBTQ communities of color that also have spiritual practice just by taking up space reimagines this idea of materiality, this, this idea of of, of becoming through intersubjectivity. So that's, I'll say, I'm pointing to her work because she's doing some great stuff and in spaces that are not ritual, like ritualized spaces for, you know, doing a ceremony that this is, you know, a park in front of a cathedral and, 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 and taking up that space. So I think that, that her work is very exciting and, and turning to Lugones' idea of, of street walking in La Callejera as a way of, of thinking through um, the space that this also has to be mobile. I think mobility is part of, or movement is part of how this space becomes, um, the, the body becomes multiple and supple. Uh, the idea of the most uh, materiality being supple actually comes directly from Al, uh, Alan Kardec's Book of the Spirits. There's, it's a very interesting dialogic book where the um, mediums ask, you know, what is materiality? 
And the spirit says, oh, it's, it's something way more supple than you guys understand. It's very subtle. The way we experience materiality is very different. So there's, there's a long history of, of how people, even when they're trying to, to negotiate religious traditions like spiritualism in modernity, like in the 19th century, with modernity, they're still like arguing what is materiality, what is not materiality. But in terms of the, the second part of answering your question is that I am very much intrigued uh, and, 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 and really interested in this work of seeing how in particular communities, uh, uh, performance communities that include LGBTQ plus uh, members in Cuba are um, accessing their performative uh, chosen kin as well as their santeria or their spiritual chosen kin as ways of, of rethinking um, the, the public sphere, but also rethinking um, how to create community. In particular, um, I'm, my next project really trying to look at how uh, drag kings in Havana, um, who are also part of Santeria communities, are negotiating these different spaces of being part of families that have chosen kin. Um, and how do they negotiate those spaces with regard to um, agency <laughs> in, in, multi in multiple ways, right? Even within the context of um, performativity and queer performativity in Cuba, uh, the, the particular group that I, I want to work with um, was not allowed to perform because they were told by drag queens that women, women, however you define, shouldn't be performing on stages. So um, there's this really interesting look at uh, resid you know, res other kinds of residuals of patriarchy and phallocentrism in um, these other spaces that I'm very interested in. And um, I hope that answers your question. So I, I'm, I don't have a complete answer, but that's kind of where I'm going to next in my next book project. Yes, more than, thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Now you have a question from the distinguished folklorist, Marilyn White. Wow, you guys are just too much sometimes. <laughs> um, maybe it's um, because I've been uh, seeing examples of this in other kinds of work that um, as I was listening to you and you're talking about um, uh, the work of beading, uh, the, uh, various kinds of material culture. Um, and I was listening particularly to see reference or to hear references um, about uh, food ways, about um, cooking. Um, and I did see uh, the friend and there was a spread that was there. But um, I, I didn't hear a, as much as I thought there might be, especially because of the association of uh, the Orishas with very specific kinds of foods. Food and uh, preparation. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And um, I, I wondered if uh, you had looked at that or if that just didn't come up um, as much for you. Thanks. It's Yes, thank you, Marilyn. I, I would I could write a whole nother book on that. Absolutely, you know, um, it, it comes up all the time. The the Orishas need their and the dead need their food prepared in specific ways, you know, and they and in in particular, uh, and people have particular recipes and and what works in, in one house may not work in another house. So absolutely. Um, that is very important. And you did see the ofrendas para Chango y Santa Barbara and also an ofrenda for, um, for uh, El Egua. And that's a really interesting uh, ritual. My cousin is a, is, a, is a child of El Egua. And what they do before we do anything important in the house is they do this, this with food mostly, a piñata for El Egua. They invite the neighborhood children. They give them all like the yummy treats they want. And then they have a big cake. And then after they do the piñata, they're supposed to cut the cake and the child, the children are supposed to take the cake and smear the, the my cousin uh, with the cake as a form of cleansing. So that's an interesting, I want I've been wanting to write about that. So absolutely, Marilyn. And, um, and to give another shout out to Martin Sang, Martin Sang has done some very interesting work. Uh, I don't know if you want to say a little something uh, uh, in terms of recipes for Inle. And um, his and and preparing his foods. I don't know if Martin wants just wants to say hi so people can see him. 
<laughs> Thank you, Sully. I appreciate it, uh, your work and also for including me in this. Yeah, um, very briefly, part of uh, the worship of Edinle that you so eloquently spoke about is his annual festival in October. And it uh, includes uh, producing these sweets, which are called La Tortilla de San Rafael, to, uh, Saint Rafael's Tortillas. And they are actually, it has been documented, especially by Cabrera, that it was a guild of lesbian ororisha or, or female priestesses that would both produce this um, delicacy, this specialty on Saint Raphael's day in honor of Erinle, uh, as well as create a straw effigy or a fish um, and, and actually burn it for him. So there's this really lovely intermixing of cultures. I love it. Saint Raphael um, as a patron of healing, um, this celebration of his feast day with a suite and this inclusion and celebration specifically by and for and claiming Erinle or Inle um, by um, lesbian um, Olorisha in, in Havana and Regla. So that's a really lovely way of sort of mixing all of those elements together. Thank you, Solly. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> now you see why I love Martin, you know, he, he has the answers that I don't. <laughs> um, so you probably remember Professor Emeritus of Anthropology, Stanley Brandis, and longtime member of the Folklore Graduate Group, and he has a question for you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that very animated talk, very interesting. I have a very specific question, and it's about your statement <clears throat> that you collaborate with the dead and you ask the dead permission uh, to publish pictures, statements, information, whatever. Could you just say how you go about doing that? Exactly, you know, just a description ethnographically how you do it. And I'd like to know if any of those dead refuse to give you permission and if they tell you why. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay, there's multiple ways, you know, and, th and there's certain things I can't talk about. And, I, and, and this is where Glissant's idea of opacity, the right to opacity comes in, right? In terms of, the, of course, there as an initiated person, I can't talk about certain things, certain rituals, but I can tell you um, that, of course, like at the, in the beginning example, uh, when I'm talking about Tomasa, tell me about her dreams, right? And she's using the chamalongos, which are dry discs of coconut that are used to talk to um, palo and gangas, ofrendas, right? That, and those in-house certain kinds of dead, right? And then I wouldn't have been able, you know, she, and after, you know, we start talking, I said, well, ask him if I can include that, right? In, in ask El Senor if I can include this in my book, right? Uh, so you can, you can, there's multiple ways, or if you're dealing with Orisha traditions, you can develop, it's, these are intimate relationships, right? And so you can develop um, a relationship where you talk to your Oshun or you talk to your Yamaya with, um, with Obi. Well, it's not really Obi because Obi is coconut, but Obi in, in Cuba and Lukumi it are, uh, co are, you know, the four coconut, um, coconut right. uh, pieces of coconut. And you can talk to them, Obi. And I don't know if you've been to a Misa Spiritual, but the dead will tell you if they do not like what you are doing. <laughs> they will tell you. There's, and they, 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 the thing they do is air out people's la dirty laundry. So if they were having problems with that, but you can ask, well, you know, if I'm, you know, if Ta Jose manifests himself or if Madre de Agua manifests herself, I can say, you know, Madre de Agua, is it okay if I put this in my study? That's, I mean, there's multiple ways. You, they can also communicate through dreams. When, there's, when they're unhappy, they can also communicate through dreams. But to answer your question, there's direct ways, you know, um, that you can communicate with different entities. I mean, that's, that's the thing about this work that, that um, I really wanted to bring out as well, is that there's a tradition of communication. And we know this from Bascom's work way back, you know, when we were talking about Ifa and all these other components. But there is also a, a, a tradition of transcription. And, and, you know, and so people not only divine, but they also make transcripts of divination. So people keep track of these communications. And so um, you can, they're supposed to be, these entities are accessible. They're supposed to be accessible. 
uh, for all facets of your life. It doesn't matter if I'm a scholar or if I'm a doctor, if I'm a nurse, if I'm a kindergarten teacher, they're going to they're gonna have a suppleness to be able to answer questions directly through these modes. Is that specific enough? <laughs> yes. Thanks Good. a lot. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that question reminds me, I've done a lot of work on interviewing and I've been working a lot on plant human relations uh, recently. So after a talk not too long ago, I got a question, how do you interview a plant? But anyway, so um, you um, have a question now from my good friend and esteemed colleague in ethnic studies in the Latinx Research Center, Laura Perez. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Solimar, gracias. That was such a such a rich, such a rich presentation. I, I've gracias. been so stimulated by your book. Um, there are so many, you provide so much language so much bridging for how we're going to be able to like talk, continue talking and thinking and, and like um, normalizing, right? The presence of the spirits, right? And other philosophies that they're grounded. So I really appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask if you would talk more about, I'm super fascinated by how you arrived at this understanding, the sense of like the current, the present scholar continuing the work of ancestor scholars. I think that's incredibly fascinating. And I love that idea of the continuation of work, right? So I just wanted to hear you talk more about that. Thank you, Laura. And thank you so much for all your support and your wonderful book, Eros Ideologies. It's been deeply influential and I'm just, it's ah, so much richness there. Um, yeah, there's there's a couple of different ways I would I would like to answer this this you know to, to ch start talking about this. One of them is actually very deeply personal. Um, when I started working on this project uh, years ago, my mother was uh, had been battling breast cancer for a long time, and she you know she towards you know the middle part of this project she you know took a turn for the worst and. Um, especially during the latter part of, of writing this book and, and getting it finished, she passed away. And that made me really rethink my relationship to uh, ancestors, the dead, people who have taught me in multiple ways, um, you know, the, all these different forms of sacred pedagogy in some ways. Uh, and so that really made me start paying attention. That really made me start paying attention to what was happening with the community I was working with uh, as, as a practitioner and as a, a, as a scholar, but also the archive. The archive became a place of solace for me um, in thinking about my, re my changing relationship to my mother. Um, I then started seeing or sensing a changing relationship with figures like Cabrera and Landis who served as mothers in some ways in terms of the influence that their, their work um, played you know, through my earlier transformative years. Um, so for me, it was really um, a way of, of rethinking how to make the work matter and how to vivify the work. So taking again, the strategies that I would see on the ground in terms of making an altar para chango, for example, or the piñata para el igua, those, those, those offerings are, are given, they are enjoyed, and then we have memories of them. There's residuals of them. And then, and then we are asked to then do it again or, or make something different, right? This is cyclical work. So I think it's out of, it was out of grief and out of a way of thinking through grief um, and understanding and taking to heart the lessons that the people in the community I was working with were telling me about grief and what that work can be in terms of, of not only providing um, ways of vivification, but also sowing, sowing my own, dispersing my own seed for later on. And so some of this work I've been really trying in terms of pedagogically to take this into my graduate courses and to, into the work that people are doing here. Um, so as these kinds of inspiration, I have a, a student now I'm teaching a course on anti-racist, transnational feminist and LGBTQ theory and folklore. That's a graduate course. And I have a student who is, is a poet, but works and is um, and works with Aoife divination poetry. 
and sexuality. And now this student's gonna write poetry, but also choreograph with one of our new faculty members who is teaching Afro-Cuban dance, um, choreograph the poems to do this work based on divination, this, in this case, divination, right? And all the, these different issues that, that, um, that come up in doing this work, right? And what does it look like uh, in terms of uh, ethics? It, you know, if you wanna use divination, you have to, you can't use the whole verse and you have to kind of hide it, but then you also have to get to the spirit of it. So it's really, um, it's really an exercise in, in a kind of creativity, like I said, that has this really intuitive, intuitive base. And we've been taught over and over again to not trust our, our, our intuition, right? Especially if we're scholars of color for women, um, you know, that is, that is a big no-no and a big way of disenfranchising our ability, right? To analyze or whatever, right? Um, and, uh, I think that this is a this is an invitation. It's, my, this work is an invitation to say no. We're missing a whole lot if we don't pay attention to those aff affective sen sensorial um, clues, and especially in the archive. So, thank you for that question. Well, during the time of COVID nineteen, when we're surrounded by death and grief, that's a really wonderful uh, reflection. Um, we now have a visitor from the University of, of Michigan, um, Aurelis Troncoso, if you'd like to ask your question. Hello, everyone. Peace, blessings. Um, Dr. Solima Lotero, thank you so much for your work and for your time and energy. I myself, as a PhD candidate, I try writing a paper, and um, the paper was about one of my um, ancestors, and part of um, the archive that I was using was actually mediumship of my own. Mm, so wonderful. It, it, it's so nice, so refreshing and so affirming to just, you know, that to just have a scholar like you so respected in the community actually bring this to the forefront. Because I think that, you know, when I first brought this up to one of my professors, she was very much kind of like, oh, I don't know how you, how that, how you going to navigate that. Right. Mm. And so I actually have two questions. Um, I know I just tricked you in that, but um, <laughs> now that I have like all this filing, I'm just wondering, um, how do you deal with, I don't know if you have had any, and you know, like I did any pushback from um, oh, yes. the academy, right. About um, using this form or using mediumship as a form of archive, which I'm very much interested in my own work with uh, thinking about queer and trans practitioners in Puerto Rico, so of Santeria. So I was wondering Wonderful. if you can talk about that. And then I had a question because I'm currently reading Roberto Strongman's recent publication. Yes, um, I, I, wrote a, I wrote a book review of it. Yeah, I okay. I send it to you. <laughs> oh, please. Okay, that's wonderful. I, I was just wondering, because, you know, I mean, it's 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 an amazing book. I'm, I'm just getting through it. And I was wondering, my question was, how do you see um, your work, particularly on mediumship and MISAs, um, as a form of archive in conversation with Romerto Strongman's um, particular work on transcorporality? So. Right, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for both those questions. And thank you for doing your work. I think it's really important, and and I'm so excited for you. And no, no le hace caso a esa gente que dicen esas cosas. Like, <laughs> that's what I say. Uh, no, really, honestly, no. Of course, I had pushback all the way through. I mean, you know, and it's and it's just a matter of it's. That's why I wanted to write the book was to resituate the methodology, right, and say, well, if we're really gonna, you can't just go and 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 mine people's traditions. You have to, like listen right you don't collect a story and then you know you don't listen to the meaning right this is this is this is about this is actually now i'm getting now you you hit a nerve so now i don't know <laughs> so i knew i is, would <laughs> yeah yeah I'm like, mm. <laughs> so this is no this is this is really this is really about um decolonizing certain practices right this is really about resituating authority resituating whose knowledge and um, and resituating this idea of, like I said, objectivity or discovery that is so much based on um, these kind of uh, these these ideals that that came about through the Enlightenment and modernity, and and that's why for me Edward Glissant's work was so 
central his 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 work on um on transphysical poetics and the way he talks about opacity and specific specificity he's really against universalisms right and that really helped me to kind of have the language to to kind of um get into those arguments and to say you know this is this is a specific place this is a specific place that comes from a caribbean experience and it's okay if you can't relate to it or understand it or you know, not everything is, and this is one another thing about Anna Marie Lord's book that I love. She has a she has a uh, a footnote where she says, um, "If you don't understand, that's okay. Everything's not for you." <laughs> so I think that that's a really interesting. But but to be honest, I think that there is the the discomfort. I think is for um, it's because people want translatability. They want they want you to translate. They want to understand. They want to have access to the knowledge, but that you don't get to have the access to the knowledge just like that, right? That's not how, that's, this is not how it's working anymore, right? And even if they thought it was working that way, then what they were saying wasn't really better. But, uh, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, I think that that's, so keep on doing your work and keep on and keep on and don't, you know, it's, it's going to keep on happening. So don't like, cause it still happens to me, but I think that it's just more important, you know, to work, who are you working for? Who are you working with, right? And like recalibrating that. And I think that that's, you know, we're, we are in a world right now where there is a lot of um, the, the complexities of all the, all, the, all the polarization, the polemics. I mean, there is stuff that's going on. And of course it's gonna, and all of these kinds of attitudes of white supremacy and, and homophobia and patriarchy is gonna affect the way that people react to how we do our research. Right. And we got to be ready for that battle, you know? Yes. So, and so Roberto, I, I, you know what I really like about where my work and his kind of really have a synergy. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk too much about it in this talk, but I do a lot of literary criticism. Mm -hmm. I do work with, I work with po poetry and I also have written on Cuban film and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. his, not, not so much an idea of transcorporality, which I really like. Um, and I like the fact that he does it with Baudun and all these different, like these different sites, but I, he has a concept of transcription, scripturality that mm -hmm. I really dig. Cause I, that's kind of like, especially when I'm doing my literary criticism and I'm thinking about, um, the, like this idea of the archive of the imagination or what we can do with our imagination. I think his, that his book, he, I think where he really excels is when he's looking at art and when he's looking at literature and he's bringing that the idea of transcorporeality mm -hmm. into these represent these realms of representation right so right. um yeah i yeah i i really i i enjoyed his i enjoyed his book so good thank you so much thank you sure. i can see from your response that you're also a great mentor so thank you for that we um we i realized that we are keeping you up till 9.31 in oh, Indiana. Oh, my bedtime. We've, we've got a little bit of your boundless energy still left. It, it seems as if Martin Sang has, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll have the last question for you. Ah, uh, as oh. you should. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, again, thank you for this. It's very generative, uh, incredibly special. Um, when you showed the image of Carmen Extravaganza, and we've spoken a little bit about this before, yes. but something really honestly just crystallized. Um, so the, the dance wand for Shango in the, part, in, in the background, um, it is, it's used for dance. It's used to demonstrate and to, to sort of bring, to bring down to earth the deity Shango. And as you know, both in Yoruba practice through the work of J. Lauren Matori about the worshippers of Shango being dressed as women if they're men and, and uh, the whole um, idea of um, penetration. But it also got me thinking that how you have really brought, excuse me, brought, brought us there to talking about the trans community in, in New York who are, dev many are devout Orisha worshippers. Yes. And it got me to thinking about the nature of dance in Lukumi and also in possession. We have our, our good friend, Alex Fernandez, and maybe he could just very briefly comment on Odu as well. Oh, but, Alex. Um, yeah, have you, um, so for me, I, I had this sort of crystallization of Shango as this consummate walker between two worlds of both drag and trans aesthetics yes. and performances or embodiments. 
wondered if you have any comments on that. I'm kind of springing that onto you and also just sort of bringing that out there to that I feel that there's a need to explore that further, but I'm happy that you brought that to us and to me. I'm happy you brought that to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, the Oshe, right, we, it's two, right? It's this double, it's a double axe, right? So I think that there's that, du that you're right, there's, Shango plays with that duality all the time. But what I'm, th what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing from uh, your, your comments is also that the embodiment, the and Ashe that's in the Oshe is the Asha that becomes in the dancer. That there is this mutual um, kind of uh, uh, expression of Ashe, of that vital energy that is being re-solidified in multiple ways. It's at making us ask about mutability and form. That's kind of like what I, because I'm on that trip right now because I just did this talk. So that's what I'm thinking right right there. And so um, I think that there's that aspect there. Uh, absolutely. And um, yeah, uh, well, maybe Alex does want to say something. Or not, I don't know. Alex, you're muted. I'm sorry. First I was on camera and didn't know I was on camera. Hello everyone, hello Soli. Um, hello. everybody. I, I've been toasting yeah. corn in my kitchen for a babalua yes ceremony, but absolutely paying attention to this wonderful talk. You know that you are um, an inspiration and also an abude, a sister in this tradition. Um, Martin mentions, um, Chango and the, um, the Oche Chango. The Oche Chango is a product actually um, from the Odu of Baramei, where Chango joins two separate axes and, it's a, uh, axes and it's a symbol of joining heaven and earth and his power to conquer wars both in the skies and the ethereal space and on the very terrestrial plane for us. Um, Martin sent me a text message to talk about Chango, and I think one of the first examples we have in um, Yoruba, and then better explained, I think, in Lukumi tradition, where um, Chango is probably the first uh, drag queen that we have in this tradition, where in the Odu Obeyono, Oya to uh, prevent Ogun, his brother, but also enemy, right. from defeating him, dresses him in her clothing. And um, through this uh, transformation, through uh, this, this mystical garmentry, as she's weaving pieces of her hair into his and putting her garments on him, he's transformed. At, at, I guess he could compete on RuPaul and probably win the prize. That's how good it was, right? <laughs> um, and she, she performs this mystical transformation and the, the irony in that story to bring it to what Martin is asking about the Oche is that what he walks out with um, as a symbol, something to remind folks that he, it's still him, is this Oche and the reason being okay. because of the breasts on the Oche. So there's, that speaks to That's a lot right. of- That's right, I was gonna say about the breasts. and gender and the fluidity um, in, in, in Espiritismo, the same in the, in the Orisha realm. Um, and to think that it was, I mean, Chango's story is probably the first drag queen example we have in Yoruba slash Lukumi, um, Odu and theology, theology, so. Ashe, thank you for that. You're yeah, welcome. and in, in Nigeria, I mean, the, 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 the different designs, the different designs in the cornrows of, were, that were worn by Chango priests are bridal designs that, yes. are very, that are very specific and only for brides and priests of Chango. So yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that. See, ah, we were gonna get a story and I was, I'm happy we got a story. <laughs> <laughs> well. Speaking of ancestors, I'm sure that your teacher, Alan Dundies, is extremely proud of you tonight. I'm glad that his children, um, David and Lauren, were able to join us today. Um, thank you so much for coming back to Berkeley. Thank you for the richness of all of your work, but also your willingness to share so much of it. And frankly, that was one of the best book talks I've ever heard. I mean, that was a lot of the book packed into one oh four, gosh, five, I know, five. I know. It, it, <laughs> no, no, that's a compliment. Let me let me assure you. So um, thank, I hope that you will all join me in one token of appreciation for Solimar Otero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you thanks everybody. to all of you for joining us today. This was a delight. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sully. Thank you, Charles. And thank you, Leah.
Thank you, Rosemary. So nice to see you. You too. Good to see all of you. Yes. Uh, brilliant, yes. Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you're doing well, Rosemary. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you again, Charles. Hello, Salimar. Gracias. Gracias, Laura. Buenas noches. Oh. Seguimos en comunicación. Claro, 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 claro. <laughs> I'm just hanging out until the end. <laughs> I figure since I'm the lady, you know. <laughs> All right. Good night. Thank you so much. Well, just good night. All right. And and be in touch if you want me to, to have a meeting with the students. As you can see, I really like talking to students. <laughs> Got that. Okay. All right. Bye, Sada. Bye, everybody. Thanks again, Leah. Bye.